Hi, everybody. Uh, keep getting food if you haven't gotten some. We know uh, that there are multiple motivations for everyone being here. and We, we like to feed both the mind and the soul. Uh, so my name is uh, David Wilkins. I'm the director of the program on the legal profession, and this is our almost every week speaker series in which we try to bring in people who are doing interesting things in the legal profession. Uh, and uh, we have two terrific people who are, I think, pioneering a model of a new kind of law firm. Actually, we had a lot of interesting discussion before we came. How new is it? How similar is it to a traditional law firm? What's different about it? But I think they've been thinking in very innovative ways, which have been actually recognized by lots of people as uh, people who are really thinking about where the future of our profession is going after uh, big law. So they're one of the rise of the alternatives. So it's Michael Ramon from uh, Ramon PC, and also Jakob Silberman. Uh, I think uh, one's the manager, he's the CEO, he's the managing partner. Oh, sorry, we're the way around. No, we're both managing partners. Oh, you're both. Oh, sorry, we've got the wrong thing on it. They're big cheeses, whatever. They run the joint. Anyway, so please, take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, you know, this is more of an informal guided discussion, so please feel free to, you know, raise your hand if you have questions as we go along. Also, feel free to just eat. That's the only reason I have a of these things. <laughs> so, yes, we're going to be talking today about the convergence, on the one hand, of the growing dissatisfaction with big law, and at the same time, the rise of alternatives. One does not necessarily uh, rely on the other, but uh, due to similar changes in society and business models, uh, they, they are now converging. So there's been a lot of talk lately, particularly in the press, uh, I don't know if you've seen this New Republic article, um, about uh, big law and crisis, uh, death spiral, um, more trouble in big law, about how there's uh, too much internal competition, how conflicts are a major issue, uh, how uh, prices have gotten astronomically high for clients, how there's too much leverage to uh, young associates with less experience, um, about uh, how they're too big, causing too much bureaucracy, and, uh, and just generally there's lack of firm culture and stability. Um, I personally think much of this is overstated. Uh, I don't think that big law is dying, uh, but I do think that uh, much of it must change. So I'm going to talk to you about how we got here. How did big law become what it is? And then uh, my partner, Yako, is going to talk to you about the rise of the alternative. Most of what we now know as the traditional big law or elite law firm model really evolved in the 20th century. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the cravat system that started in the early 1900s, which created the associate model, the assembly line of what I think of as the assembly line of the mid 20th century, uh, which brought around uh, hyper specialization. The billable hour that started in the 1960s in response to client demand. The American lawyer rankings that started in 1987, creating an obsession with profits per partner and revenue and the repercussions of that. And I'm going to tell you about the rise of the mega firm in the 1990s, how it resulted from globalization. Uh, limit, limited liability partnerships, as well as everything that came before it. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the economic crash of 2008 and the effect that it's had. Then Yaakov is going to talk about how ongoing changes in technology and society uh, converged to bring us where we are. I don't know why he's smiling. He should probably be fine. <laughs> so, at the turn of the last century, early 1900s, law firms were really loose affiliations of partners um, working together, mostly generalists. Uh, they had apprentices that weren't salaried. They would work under a partner until they were ready to go out on their own. Um, they would make money if they brought in business, um, but you know, not very much. They were really there just to learn how to do the work and eventually become partners in their own firm, and maybe they would be brought in as a partner of that firm. Paul Cravath changed that. He came up with what became known as the Cravath system. First of all, he created an associate track, a partnership track. Uh, associates would be recruited from top law schools, 
uh, specifically at that time only from this law school, Harvard Law, as well as uh, only the top graduates of Ivy League law schools. They would only be hired straight out of law school. And in order to be, become a partner of the firm, they would have to have started uh, as a young associate at the firm and uh, stayed until they became partner. Then he instituted the up or out model, where if, a, if an associate survived a year, they would go up to the next level, first year, second year, third year, and so forth. And, and he gave them salaries. And the salaries were lockstep. So again, if you survived, you made as much as everybody else in your class. This lockstep model also applies to partners. As long as you stayed as a partner, you got a higher salary every year. It didn't matter how much business you brought in. Um, you know, it wasn't based on reviews. Basically, as long as you made it, you, you made a step up. But a lot of people wouldn't make it, of course. It was kind of a funnel. He also believed in centralized management with a lot of executive powers. He was very much against silos, so partners had to contribute. Uh, they had to work together, which, again, was part of the reason for the uh, centralized management and this associate model. What this meant was, first of all, in order to make a partner, you had to be an associate firm for a few years. So people, the other partners could really vet you. They got to know you. They really knew you know, your personality. You were really part of the firm. And also, you know, in society in general back then, people didn't move around very much. Uh, you, if you wanted to be a managing partner at Cravath, you have to start as an associate at Cravath. You wouldn't matter what. What this also meant was that there's this whole pyramid structure now where associates need to be kept busy and they have salaries that have to be paid. So it created leverage. Work would be pushed down to the associates, the easier work, then it would be reviewed by the more senior associates who would then be reviewed by partners and so on. By the 1920s, most law, elite law firms have already uh, adopted this model, actually by 1910. Right? Between World War I and World War II, the elite law firms actually polluted as to what the associate salaries would be. Um, it was a very popular model and took over. This led to an assembly line, again, much like society in general and the businesses in, in the United States. Uh, because of the cravat system of specialization, um, attorneys became hyper-specialized, so a tax attorney would just look at the tax issues, a junior associate may just do document review, and you know, M&A lawyer might just do M&A work. Uh, rather than a more generalist approach, maybe an attorney with their apprentice doing, doing everything. Until the 1960s, clients were simply billed by a bill that said for services rendered. The bill was calculated by the law firm as to what they thought was the value of, of their services. Um, and that was fine, and you know, everybody was fine with that until the 1960s when clients started to demand clearer metrics. They wanted to know why they were going to be billed a certain way, uh, how this was calculated. And that was the birth of the billable hour. So attorneys were given a billable hour rate based on their seniority. Again, not necessarily based on what value they bring in or how particularly good they are, but if they made it to a third year associate, that their billing rate was X. If they made it to a junior partner, it was Y. And then that billable hour would be multiplied by time. And that's how a client was built, not based on necessarily value or efficiency or expertise, but time put in and by whom. Uh, and when this was started in the 1960s, about 1,300 hours of billable hours a year were expected from attorneys. Now, as I'm sure most of you know, for associates at elite firms, 23, 2,400 is, is more uh, normal. So it did actually drive, uh, drive the focus towards the billable hour, increasing the billable hour, increasing the cost of the billable hour because that's how profits were, uh, went up as opposed to increasing efficiency or value. In 1987, further metrics were uh, brought into the business of law. Um, the American lawyer started to rank law firms, wanted to rank them as you would rank Fortune 500, and it used revenue and profits per partner to measure how successful a law firm was. Profits per partner in particular became synonymous with prestige. 
the higher the profits per partner, the better the firm must be, the easier that firm could actually recruit better young associates, uh, the more they could build their clients, and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it created an obsession, actually, with profits per partner and revenue by, by law firms. Um, and it was all about increasing the profits per partner. It was all about increasing revenue. Now, there are certain ways you can do that. You can increase profits per partner by having less partners, increasing the partnership track from six years to 10 years, which happened, um, by bringing in more uh, rainmakers, paying them more money as opposed to lockstep to bring in the attorneys that were bringing in a lot of work to uh, create an incentive for them to move from where they were, by de-equitizing partners or service partners who aren't bringing in business and aren't <laughs> increasing the bottom line. And you can increase revenue <coughs> by merging. If you have two small firms, they merge, immediately the revenue doubles. It's not necessarily better for the clients. It's not necessarily better for the individual lawyers. But it increases the revenue. Gives you a higher ranking on the AMLA revenue list. Before 1992, law firms <coughs> had, did not have limited liability. One partner would be liable for the actions of another partner, personally liable. So this meant if you worked with your partner, your partner committed malpractice, was sued, you could lose your house, your children you know, might not have money to go to school, uh, very, very high risk. So you wouldn't take on a partner unless you really knew them very well. And again, that, the cravat system was made to allow you to vet them because you're putting your life, your family's life, literally really in, in the, the hands of, of these other people. That changed. By 1996, uh, 40 states had limited liability partnerships. Um, law firms transferred into limited liability partnerships, uh, thereby decreasing the risk significantly of bringing in a lot of a partner, which cu coupled with the American lawyer rankings and obsession with revenue, increased the mergers between firms and lateral, uh, lateral partners. And you could bring in a partner you didn't know that well, you're not risking your whole life on them. All of this leads to mega firms. You're merging, firms are increasing revenue, there's less liability, <coughs> there's globalization in general, so your clients are all over the world. You wanna be in the same place as your clients are, you wanna say that we can serve you in Tokyo, as well as Boston, as well as San Francisco. So there's even more pressure to to merge and become bigger. Also, management becomes more and more centralized, so the management of the firm has a greater incentive to grow the firm because they go from managing a smaller firm to managing a larger firm. Again, this is not necessarily better for the clients. It's not necessarily better for the lawyers. But it happens. In fact, uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal a couple days ago that mega firms are now going to be merging. Uh, I think Oric and Pillsbury were saying it might be, might be merging. This leads to higher conflicts, because if you're a partner at the San Francisco office of the mega firm, and you never work with the partner in the Jakarta office, it doesn't matter, because if they have a, a client conflict with your client, you can't do the work. It leads to more bureaucracy. Someone has to manage this huge system. You can't have flexibility. You can't have uh, easier ways to change the way you bill. There has to be a very clear system. Everybody at this level has to bill at this hourly rate. It's just too hard to, to uh, customize. And it leads to increased leverage. There are a lot more associates that need to be kept busy. So you have to use more associates, push more work down to the associates. There's more internal competition because there are now hundreds of partners. A big law firm in the last two decades has gone in size from two to 300 lawyers to 2,000 lawyers. Completely changed the face of the law firm. You went from knowing most or all of your partners to knowing very relatively few of them. Um, <coughs> and ultimately, you're not even working with most of them. Which also, by the way, changes the culture of the firm. There's no clear culture. There's no huge loyalty. Moving around is a lot easier. This all works fine when the economy is doing very well. Clients are willing to pay very high prices. There's plenty of work to keep the associates busy. The partners can bring in more business. But when the economy is not doing well, this is a very difficult system to sustain. So 
Here are an example of a few law firms that uh, experienced major difficulty as soon as the economy started to struggle. So Brobeck was one example. In, 2000, in, in the 1990s, during the dot-com bubble, Brobeck was one of the oldest and most prestigious San Francisco-based firms. So they were doing very well during the dot-com bubble. Uh, when times were good, they grew. They brought in lots of lateral partners, lots of associates, lots of real estate to keep all these people, uh, thinking that the good times would never end. But they did end. And as soon as the uh, dot-com bubble burst, many of the rainmakers saw the financials, started to look elsewhere. The firm started to unravel. They couldn't sustain their costs. No longer exists. In 2008, we saw more of a national uh, pattern of, of the same kind of thing. <coughs> Howry, a DC-based firm, one of the oldest and most prestigious DC-based firms, focused mostly on litigation, grew rapidly before 2008. 2008 hit, their clients were not willing to pay as much money for litigation. They weren't doing as much litigation because it wasn't worth it. And their two biggest rainmakers died unexpectedly. So the second tier of rainmakers started to look elsewhere, got some media attention. Everybody else started to look for work. Firm no longer exists. Similar story in San Francisco's Heller Ehrman and Philadelphia's Wolf Block. The one that got the most attention is Dewey and the Book. There's an example of bringing in lateral partners, rainmakers with a lot of money. During the good times, they merged, paid a lot of money, very high salaries, promised very high salaries to rainmakers to come to Dewey, uh, again, thinking the good times wouldn't end. But 2008 hit, they weren't able to cover a lot of their costs, the top rainmakers got upset, they started to look elsewhere, creating the spiral of debt. Law firm no longer exists. So that's where we are, and Jakob's going to talk about how this converged with uh, the rise of alternatives. Thanks. So we fast forward to the last decade and a half. And what Michael's been describing so far is how big law came to have the characteristics that it does today. And big law is the prototypical traditional law firm. And law firms all around the world, certainly around this country, try to emulate big law for better or for worse. And so they become the model for the traditional law firm. I'm going to be speaking a lot about traditional law firm and comparing it to the alternatives that we've seen cropping up over the last decade and a half. And so just to be clear about what I'm talking about, I'll sometimes use them interchangeably. When I think of a traditional law firm, I'm thinking about you know, a group of lawyers practicing usually from a central location. They're usually in the same office, or it's groups of lawyers in multiple locations, but usually just towers of lawyers. Uh, they're generally speaking, they're going to be billing by the hour, and they're also going to be employing a lot of leverage. The way that they make more money, or one of the ways they make more money, is by putting more people at the bottom of the period so that people at the top can make more money. So those are some characteristics that traditional law firms, big law firms that they share in common. But what we've seen over the last decade and a half, and really, if you look here in the last five years or so, at least from the sampling that I've taken, there's just been this proliferation of models of law firms, of legal services companies that really don't fit that model, that they differ from that model in one way or in multiple ways. And that's a really, really interesting time. So going back to the, uh, the turn of the century, some of the earlier players that may be familiar to you are Axiom. Uh, and we had a discussion about whether Axiom was or was not just a high-end uh, legal temp agency. And it seems like they're evolving beyond that. But that's still their core business. Paragon over in San Francisco is doing a very, very similar thing. LegalZoom was groundbreaking. And that was the first time that if you were a consumer or if you're uh, either whether you're an individual or a corporate consumer, you could go online, fill in some forms, and get legal documents returned to you. You never speak to a lawyer. And in fact, the lawyers were the ones that set this thing up, but no lawyer ever touched your documents. And that was just revolutionary. Pangea 3 was another uh, revolution in legal process outsourcing. They had armies of attorneys overseas, generally speaking in, uh, in Mumbai and India. And this would complement and supplement the services that outside counsel were providing. So that if they had some large scale document review or due diligence project, you could actually have most of that work, most of that grunt work done by highly skilled but much lower cost attorneys overseas. And there's a whole bunch of other examples. They were acquired by Thomson Reuters. It's very attractive. A uh, bunch of other models too. Um, you've got virtual uh, law firms like uh, VLP and uh, Potomac Law Group. Uh, one that's really interesting to, uh, to us, I guess coming from San Francisco, you also have crowdsourcing for legal services, which is just absolutely amazing. Companies like Rocket Lawyer, Law Pivot, Law Dingo. I mean, I actually get spammed by these people all the time right now. You know, a client has a question about X, can you help out? But that's really interesting because all of a sudden you have clients, uh, for better or for worse, you know, and they're individuals, they're also corporations, 
and they're posting their questions online, and they're just blasting it out to lawyers all around the world who are competing for their business. And sometimes they'll go ahead and they'll answer these questions for free, and depending on whether or not it turns into a paid uh, representation, they'll go out and they'll find clients and represent them uh, based on, on these crowdsourcing platforms. So this is really, really interesting. I mean, there's now, particularly for people graduating from law school right now, uh, there's now this wider array of things that people graduating from law school might do because these companies, they want lawyers. They want people from top law schools, but they might not be doing legal work. You might do you know, project management, you might be doing product development, you might be doing sales and business development. All of these roles need to be filled, and generally speaking, they're looking to lawyers and business people, but also lawyers, to fill these roles. So why do these things exist? I mean, a company needs to exist for a purpose. So why do these alternatives exist? Uh, we'll talk about that quite a bit over the next little while, but I want to highlight a few reasons that justify their existence, or supposedly justify their existence. The big problem that they're trying to solve, by and large, is really one of cost. And that's no surprise at all. Because if you look at the incentives that Michael was describing before, they're really, he mentioned, there are only a few ways that you can make more money if you're a partner, if you're an owner of a law firm. That's what they are. They're owners of law firms, they're shareholders, and they're there by and large, to serve their clients, of course, but they're also there to make profit. So uh, you know, it's not like uh, an Apple product where you can just sell more iPhones. There's a couple of ways. You can add more leverage at the bottom. So you can add more associates and fewer people at top. You can uh, impose minimum billable hour requirements and say that, hey, you, know, you have to bill more and more, because if you work more, then you'll get more out of the people you're paying salary to. You can also raise rates. And so that's kind of been the strategy over the last, you know, 50 years, maybe even up to 100 years, let's just kind of fall into that pattern, de-equitize, add more people at the bottom, raise rates, so forth, and you'll make more money. And so what that creates is this sort of upward spiral where rates just start getting absolutely out of control. It's not just the absolute prices that bother people. It's actually also the opacity of the whole thing. So I've heard a lot of corporate counsel, I've heard this metaphor employed more than once, where corporate counsel say that hiring an outside law firm is like breaking your arm, going to the emergency room, and not having insurance. So you've got something really important you need to get done. Your arm is broken. You have no idea what it's going to cost, but you have to do it. And so this billable hour model where you say, I, I, you know, I need to do this project and try to get a price out of these law firms, I say, well, it depends on all these contingencies. And you get this bill, and it's, just, it just, it's, it's skyrocketing. So uh, you know, these incentives mean that uh, there's, there's places in the market, there's openings in the market for people to find a better way. Related problem we talked about before, too, is one of quality. So if you're just going to be making more money by adding more people at the bottom, uh, increasingly, you see corporate counsel being upset with that because they don't want associates, people fresh out of law school, not this law school, other law schools, <laughs> learning on the job. And that's a, that's a big problem. And so we actually see right now, I'll talk about this a little bit later too, we're getting these terms and conditions from uh, our, some of our biggest clients making us promise that we won't put people with less than three years of experience on jobs. That's more and more common. Uh, and then finally also there's the issue of lifestyle. This is no surprise to anyone here. Uh, there's this increasing dissatisfaction among lawyers, people who have been in the profession for a long time, with what the practice of law has become. And so they're smart people. They're looking for if there's an alternative. And actually, the uh, New Republic article that we had up on the screen before, the author of that article referred to uh, law practice as this practice today as soul-crushing work. And so people, you know, I guess people that are willing to have their souls minced or diced, maybe for the right amount of money, <laughs> but not crushed, right? So we're looking for an alternative. <laughs> We want to see if there's a, an alternative there. So that's great. You know, these are real problems, but why now? One of the big reasons that uh, I think, these are just theories that I'm putting out there, but I believe them to be true, uh, is that the economy has really played a huge role. That 2008, in particular, was really a cataclysmic event in, uh, in the law, legal world, especially for big law, big law firms. And there was really a paradigm shift in 2008. And, uh, we only started our firm uh, in 2008, and so we kind of caught the, the, the tail end of that, um, but knew a lot about it from before, from private practice. And the paradigm for in-house uh, lawyers prior to 2008, maybe a little bit before that, was squarely CYA. It was cover your ass. And that means that if you have some sort of big corporate event, an acquisition, or a uh, fundamental patent dispute with a, uh, with a rival, or even frankly, if you have some small little unimportant dispute with a former employee, what you would do is you'd go out and you'd get the best law firm that money can buy. Because why not? You're spending other people's money, you're spending the company's money, and you probably didn't even have a budget for it. So you would go out and you'd get cravat and scat, and no matter what the problem is that you were trying to solve, 
And that way, if the project went south, you didn't get the outcome that you wanted, you could turn to the GC, you could turn to the CEO and say, hey, I hired Prada. You know, I did what I'm supposed to do, and, and you can't fault me for that. Fast forward today, it's very, very different. Corporate legal departments now have budgets, just like any other legal department, other department in a corporation. And they're expected to stay in that budget, and they have to answer to people when they go outside of that budget. So they're finding ways that they can do more with less. They're finding ways that they can extend their legal dollar and get value and get successful outcomes for, for less money. And they're finding a couple of ways to do that. But one of the great things for alternative legal services companies is it's legitimized them. Because in the past, you, know, you would have never even thought about hiring you know, a solo to work for a Fortune 500 company. That's just too risky. Nowadays, I actually know a lot of solos who are doing work for large corporations. The other thing they're doing is they're bringing more people in-house too. Because just do the simple math. If I'm going to need 2,000 hours of a lawyer's time at an outside firm at $500 an hour, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's a million dollars. I can buy that time in-house for $300,000, $400,000 and make some great savings. They can't do everything because they're not specialists, they're journalists, but maybe they can do 80% and then use outside counsel for the rest. So that's been a, a, a real, real big shift. So the economy was a huge factor. We know that that, that was true. It really sp uh, sparked a lot of change. But I mean, these problems have been around for a long time. They didn't start in 2008. Costs have been spiraling out of control for decades. And so it's not enough to just say, well, the economy had this shift, and, like, and, and all of a sudden, all these proliferation of activity and entrepreneurial activity sprang forward. We've been through recessions before, and the problems were still back there back then. But what's really happened is that technology that enabled these alternatives has really come of age in the last you know, just five, six years. And, and I really believe that Jake Bezos, um, as a father of cloud computing, had as much to do with this revolution that we're seeing right now as any legal mind out there. And so you know, in the past, just think about it. If you wanted to start a law firm, that was a tremendously expensive thing to do. You know, first and foremost, you have real estate. You need a building to house all these people that you're going to be employing. And generally speaking, in order to be competitive, it's got to be prime real estate. It's got to be in the center of town, because that's what the next guys are doing. And if you want to be competitive, you have to be there too. So that's a huge amount of money. You have to buy people. People need to run the firm. And you don't have to look that far, far back. You know, 10, 15 years ago, if you were a partner uh, in a big law firm, every single partner had a secretary, had an assistant, because that was necessary. You needed to focus on you know, billing and thinking about your problems and, and, and advising clients. Someone needed to enter your time. They need to draft correspondence, they need to take dictation and you know, arrange for couriers and faxes and so forth and so on. Nowadays, it's much more common you know, to see maybe one assistant to three partners, four partners is not too uncommon in firms. So that's another big cost, having to hire all of those people. <clears throat> another thing that you'd have to do also, and I'll talk about this at some length, is technology. So you need servers. Servers are expensive. You need network infrastructure. You need computers for everybody. You need to go out and get uh, software as well. And the old model of software licensing, we may remember this. It, well, there's vestiges of it still. If you wanted to buy Word, you need to buy a solid license for everybody. But law firm software in particular, if you wanted a billing software for your entire firm, that would be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that license. That's a huge, huge upfront. That's a huge capital expenditure. And so you know, it was easy sort of for big law, for the entrenched players, to ward off all the little guys because they just couldn't compete. They couldn't have access to these resources. It's not possible. Fast forward to today, it's totally different. I mean, and this is something that people here, and younger people, might take for granted because everyone has their, you know, their Dropbox account, which they pay, you know, five bucks a month for. They don't buy the Dropbox license; they pay five bucks a month for that, right? And even Microsoft right now, if you have, uh, well, I suppose most people here actually have Microsoft Word for free because it gives it out to students. But now in corporations, we license it. We don't buy licenses right now. We pay ten bucks a month, five bucks a month, depending on our subscription. And instead of buying it up front, we can lease it over time. So we don't need that huge capex. The next thing about that, too, is that if in bad times we have to shrink, our costs immediately shrink. Because we're paying per person, we're paying per month. We didn't have to make that huge capex that we're now not seeing, no longer seeing any uh, in uh, ROI. So that's been a huge, huge boon. And then finally, also, you know, we talked about self-administration, that people are more comfortable doing it themselves now. You know, in our firm, in particular, uh, all of our partners, they enter their own time. No one's doing dictation. I suppose the, the closest analogy I have to that is there are some people who use drag and dictate to talk their emails rather than type them. But by and large, you don't need that many assistants to do a lot of the things that you used to do before. 
So that's great for legal services companies. It's also really great for the, uh, the ecosystem as a whole because also companies that are serving law firms and companies that are serving alternative uh, legal services companies, they also have a lower barrier to entry. So rather than being you know, only two research tools out there, there's now maybe six major research tools. Instead of there being two billing software options out there, there's now 10. It's a more competitive, it brings costs down, it raises quality, it's just great for the ecosystem as a whole. So it's really just absolutely different than it was even you know, six years ago. So just a quick example, this is sort of how we have been the beneficiary of this massive change. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but one of the things that we've done is we have deleveraged quite a bit. So we do have associates in the firm, but even the youngest associate I think is like eight years of experience or so. Uh, and most of the people are partner level uh, attorneys in the firm. And so we don't really, we try to have them do most of the counseling and not push it down to uh, lower level attorneys in the firm. On the technology side, I mean, what we have access to right now is, is absolutely incredible. Uh, we didn't have to buy any of these things up front. We didn't have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to get our firm off the ground, which frankly we could not have done back in 2008. But yet we still have access to world-class document management system so that we can collaborate inside the firm, that we can give real-time access to documents to our clients no matter where they are. Um, we have you know, secure firm-wide meetings where we can video conference with our clients, with each other. And this is all for a fraction of the cost of what you might have been able to do with it yesterday. You, know, you have Facebook. We also have Yammer, which some of you may be familiar with. They were purchased by Microsoft a little while back. It's kind of an eternal social network, which bring, breeds cohesiveness. And it means that despite the fact that there's no replacement for in-person meetings, we still get together in person, and we still have you know, regional meetings. Um, this really helps the firm become a little bit more sticky, even though we're distributed uh, around the globe. So I want to talk for a little bit about the characteristics that these alternative legal services companies share. It's a hard thing to do because legal services companies or alternative legal services companies, I'm not talking about alternative law firms, they're really, really broad. We saw that before. There's you know, the Axioms out there who are uh, staffing agencies with uh, lawyers around the world. There's LPOs. There's virtual law firms. But there are some things that they all share because they're all trying in some way to address a similar problem. This is a big one, right? the issue of costs. How can we make legal services not necessarily more affordable, but more predictable? How can we help our clients budget for legal services? And one of the things that we've all heard a great deal about is alternative fee arrangements. And so these are just some common examples up here, some which may be familiar to you, uh, some which aren't. But they're all trying to do this one thing. They're trying to reward good work rather than inefficiency, because that's what clients want. They, they want. they don't want hours. They want successful outcomes. And so you know, flat fixed fees is the most straightforward example. That's where the law firm and the client will sit down and say, OK, these are the things that we need you to do. Um, here's the scope of the project. How much is it going to cost? They come to an agreement, and they stick to it. Sometimes the client wins at the end of the day, sometimes the law firm. Everyone has to manage products really, really well. But in the end of the day, it offers predictability to clients that is just gold. When you're talking to a corporate counsel who's trying to stay within budget, trying to justify an expense, that's just absolutely gold. It has its own incentive problems, though, that lawyers don't like, which is that they say, hey, you know, if I've agreed to a flat fee, why won't they just abuse my time? Because now the marginal cost of my time is zero. And they can call me whenever they want. They can pester me. They can say, hey, what do you think of this school for my kid? And you know, I really just not value my time anymore. And so what we do a lot of also is partial contingency. The contingency aspect is uh, a little bit more straightforward. And it says, you know, what's a successful outcome for the client? What does that mean for the client? And it might just be, you know, we want to get this merger done by year end. Um, we want this litigation to settle by this point, whatever it is. Let's define success. And you pay us for success. So if we do a good job and we do it quickly and efficiently, we get paid more. If we don't, we get paid less. So that's you know, the contingency part. The partial part is kind of like your health insurance plan. And it says that you have to have some skin in the game too, client. Right? So you might pay us a nominal fee, 100 bucks an hour, you know, something that's much less than the traditional hourly rate. You pay us 100 bucks an hour. And that way, you know, you might, it won't be a real barrier to having you call us, to engage with us, interact with us. But maybe it'll make you pause before you just pick up the phone and you know, ask us for restaurant recommendations or something like that. Um, so that's worked really well as well. We've also seen, this is kind of newer, pooling of clients. So um, in the Silicon Valley, it might be groups of clients that want to get together and say they have some common needs, they have some common issues, uh, maybe they need a common set of documents. Let's band together and hire the same law firm for sort of one set fee. And that way, the law firm is going to be able to give us some sort of bulk discount maybe. But also, they're going to be familiar with our common issues that we have in the trade and be able to offer us uh, you know, a more reasonable rate. So we've seen that a lot. 
And finally, increased focus on project management. Uh, real briefly, I mentioned this before. I mean, it used to be that you could just bill by the hour, send the bill, and you know, maybe there'd be some haggling, but they'd pay it. Now we have these really 10 page, in addition to our engagement letters that we send to clients, there's these 10 page documents that we have to sign saying we will you know, bill for internal meetings or we won't bill for internal meetings, how much we can bill for travel, you know, how much uh, redundancy there can be on a project, whether we're going to bill for internal meetings, all this kind of stuff that we have to agree to. And they're measuring what we do. We tag everything that we do. You know, every single call is tagged as a call to do this. Every research product is tagged so they can run analysis and say, hey, where are we spending money? What's creating value? And are we spending money on the things that are creating value? Or are we just spending money on people spinning their wheels? And you know, we can work together, hopefully, with the law firms we like better to make sure that we're actually getting value for the dollars that we're spending. Finally, we also have um, another aspect of alternative <laughs> services models, which is that they deviate from this traditional model of you know, towers of lawyers. right? So they're all global firms. There are firms that have people all over the place. But by and large, they're centralized towers of lawyers, groups of lawyers all practicing together. We've moved a little bit away from that, where we actually have distributed models. So we have uh, 40 people, 40 attorneys in the firm, and 12 locations. So you know, there's some places that have more, some places that have left. But it allows us to sort of be where our clients are and to also attract talent wherever they might be. And then, of course, on the total end of the spectrum, you know, I guess the left end of the spectrum, you have the pure online delivery of services. Companies there, you don't actually ever see a lawyer. You don't ever uh, interact with a lawyer you know, on the phone or in person. And all your interaction with them, if you know who they are at all, is done online. So that's been really, really groundbreaking. And we see that a lot in the model. <coughs> and finally, I think this is the most interesting uh, aspect of alternative legal services models. And I think it's kind of the takeaway from today. So the prior model, really, was that you know, big law was really one of the own options, or the traditional law firm, at least, was really the only option when you needed legal work done. But you can't be all things to all clients. It's just not possible. And the market's finally waking up to this. So one thing that these alternative legal services companies should have in common, and I think they do, is that they're niche players. They're not trying to say, we can do everything that your company you know, needs, whether it's a hugely important, fundamentally, existentially important project, or whether it's just some small, minor dispute with a former employee who uh, you know, slipped on a banana peel or something. And so what they're saying right now is that we are going to take our, uh, our legal work, and we're going to divvy it up. We're not just going to give it all to big law, because that doesn't make sense. The you know, question I pose up there is, would you have an what is it, aerospace engineer repair your Vespa? And the answer is, of course not, you wouldn't. The cost of that would be astronomical. And it wouldn't make any sense. You'd bring it to a mechanic. And so they're doing the same thing right now. They're saying, hey, look, for the fundamentally, existentially important stuff, uh, we're going to you know, the bet the company work. There's still a place for the crevasse, the scadence, the wild gotchels, I mean, the, the, the premier law firms. We're going to bring that work to them. We'll pay top dollar for it. We're going to get value, and we're going to be happy to do that. But hey, if we have some sort of routine little disputes or some small little commercial contract, it still needs to get done. So it's important in that it needs to get done. But if it goes south, if it doesn't go wrong, it's really not going to sink the company. It's not even going to make a big difference. And so maybe we, maybe we use one of these alternative uh, outsourcing companies, right? where that, we'll send this work to a law firm in India, even. Um, or maybe we'll you know, hire a solo for that type of work who's going to bill us at 250 bucks an hour. It just makes more sense. And then there's everything in the between. There's the, you know, the, the things that we qualify as important, meaning that maybe they drive revenue or they're important vendor contracts. But if they don't go well, they're still not going to sink the firm. And that's, that's a really, really important thing. Uh, so I think I uh, just want to point out, sure. sorry, go back to, I think it's also important to note this is not a hierarchy of quality. In fact, I would say that a lot of the alternatives that provide the more routine are actually better at doing document reviews. That's all they do, as opposed to the old big law model, which is take someone straight out of an excellent law school and ask them to review documents that they don't understand. Remember, that was the case with me. You know, um, they give you a, they put you in a warehouse and say, review all these uh, contracts and let us know if there's anything strange here. Yeah, the term is what red flags, right? Red flag. Look for red flags. And of course, yeah. you know, lawyer, uh, lawyers who recently graduated from excellent law schools, not this one, uh, <laughs> or don't want to do that and they're bored and frankly often don't do a very great job at it. Um, so I think a great thing about the alternatives is it's actually created an expertise. There are firms that this is what they do. People who have done nothing but this their entire careers, they don't think they're above it or they're not bored by it. It's what they do. And I think they're actually, in some cases, better. Um, same with important. Uh, I think that's what Axiom, Axiom kind of puts themselves in, in that 
that space, I think, uh, where they say, you know, we have people who are very good at doing the important stuff, not because they're not as good as the big, bigger firms, but because this is what they focused on. This is the expertise, licensing, outside GC. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's not a high... what space are you in? I would say we're... <laughs> He's got up. Oh, here. Um, so we would probably be somewhere between important and bet the company. If it's truly bet the company, I think CYA is still an issue. Right? If you've got, if you're doing Lehman bankruptcy, you go to Wild Doctors. Because nobody got fired for hiring Wild for bankruptcy. Um, but uh, what we do is actually use other companies for the routine stuff. We're not going to be doing document review. We're going to actually manage the project or we'll bring in uh, an outsourced contract uh, company that does that technology that we could use. We're going to focus on the higher level aspect because our attorney. <laughs> Again, they, they were partners at big firms. They're not going to be the right people to review documents. Right. And that's uh, actually what the point of this slide here, too. This is drawn from our marketing material, but it, it illustrates the point. So all of our attorneys, they have 10 years of experience. That's actually, uh, there's most of them probably on average, I think we're looking at 20 years of experience in the, in the industry right now. And so it just wouldn't really make sense. So if you, if you need you know, high-level counseling and you need sort of targeted ERISA expertise on some strategic uh, you know, pension plan investment that you're going to make, we can do that, right? But if you need armies of associates uh, to to do some due diligence project or, or whatnot, I mean, at that point, we'll say, look, yeah, we're happy to manage the project, but that's not our space, right? We're going to hire, let's hire Pangea 3. And, and they do an excellent job of that, right? So I, I think that uh, that's, that's really the most interesting thing that's happened. It happens in every other company. Professor Wilkins, we, you've spoken about that before, too. You know, Apple does not try to design their chips and manufacture their stuff and assemble and distribute. They have partners that do that. And so the idea that a law firm can be all things to all clients, it just doesn't make any sense at all. So do you, so do you handle, say, an acquisition of some significance and hire yourself the uh, LPO to manage the part that these guys don't want to do? That's a really interesting question. I mean, so that's a project management question. And yeah, we do a lot of project management internally if the client demands it. But sometimes we've also been seeing increasingly project management being handled by the client themselves. Right. And they they're sort of understand that they can save money. It's kind of like uh, being your own contractor, I right. guess, right. if you're designing, you're designing your kitchen. You know that there's some sort of embedded markup or there's some sort of embedded inefficiency. And so those clients who are good at it will say, hey, yeah, good at it. They'll say, let's you know, hire Ramon for sort of this targeted counseling on this part of the project, right? We're going to hire the, uh, you know, outsource the due diligence to these guys over here who are really good at it and so forth and so on. So that's so a... Your, so your marketing pitches to the GC, your, do you have strategic relationships with any of the large, the big law firms saying, okay, you know, use us to reduce your exposure? So I think they probably view us a little bit as a threat. We still do get referrals from them. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, I guess the beneficiary aspect is that when they have conflicts and they have many, many, many conflicts, right. they call you. we have friends there and, we get, and right. they know that we're not going to be conflicted out of these things, right? right. for the most part. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the relationship there, but um, we haven't sort of, they haven't outsourced any work to us yet to sort of take right. on a part of a project. Well, they're, they're not ready to do that yet. So there's also a lot of overlap. Yeah. yeah. So can we open it up for questions? Because I do want to make sure that we have questions for people. Yeah, go ahead. As long as you're now doing this sort of project management for all the legal pieces, has there been movement into um, adding on some of the elements, other elements? So like adding, for example, like an urban designer to your team or an architect. Or I know there's it happens with consulting, right? Problems, but it happens with consulting. We've considered that. Uh, yeah. And you know, frankly, at this point, we want to focus on what we're good at. I don't think we want to be all things to all people. Um, so we thought about bringing in CPA, uh, CPAs or, or others that are more clear synergies. But actually our model is more to focus on top quality legal work and then know who to bring in. So we often do bring in CPAs that we have relationships with, for example. But we are not looking to expand beyond legal at this point. I, I guess just to, to reframe my question slightly, not specifically for you, but one, one alternative outcome of the narrative you just presented us could be something that was much more synergies outside of just the legal profession. So or am I mis- What I was going to get at, and I'm not sure if it's answered as a question, but there's a, we have a really robust uh, records and information management uh, team in our firm. 
And so they do a lot of um, basically helping companies understand their obligations internationally with respect to the mass amount of, with big data, the mass amount of data that they collect, right? So it's uh, one thing that we'll do is we'll go out and we'll say, hey, well, this is what the law says. This is how long you have to retain these things. This is how you have to store them, blah, blah, blah. And then they say, well, great, how do we do that? So we do work closely with like change man management professionals, you know, with IT companies that can then say like, okay, well, we understand their space. We understand the, you know, the, the prescriptions that Ramon has given. And now we'll work with Ramon and with you to implement them. But we haven't brought that in-house, though, um, because once again, they're better at it. So our focus on, we might manage that process. We might sort of be the chief contact for that process, project manager, if you will. But um, we're, it's not our goal to bring that in-house, though. But do you, so, do you mean to say, will other law firms uh, bring in other uh, experts in, in this fashion that are non-lawyers? Because there are barriers in legal ethics. Right, right. so right. multidisciplinary practice. So here's the thing. In the UK, this is happening because they've eliminated the barrier between lawyers and non-lawyers being partners. And so it's easier to have multidisciplinary practice. You still have firms in the law firms in the US that have non-legal subsidiaries or ancillary businesses. Yeah. Uh, but I think the answer to your question is you're going to see a lot more of it as the regulatory is falling. Yeah. Uh, so some of the challenges which you said that uh, which uh, the big law was facing uh, was that it was going larger. Uh, uh, there was a lot of leveraging at the bottom level, the billion dollars uh, uh, system which evolved. So uh, I mean, the alternatives, including yours, how is it different from in terms of believing uh, uh, believable hours? I see that you started in 2008 and you already have so many offices. I know what is your size is. How how are you hoping? How do you propose to cope with the challenges which? big law firms faced of growing larger, uh, the central management, uh, the deliverable hours, how can right. you do that? Don't you want to be paid? <laughs> right. Well, uh, I guess maybe you can talk about uh, some of that as well, but uh, there's, a, there's a lot in there as far as how do we handle that. Um, well, for one thing, we separated management from the attorneys to practice law. So we focus on management. We focus on the business side, bringing in professionals to focus on growing the firm strategically um, and safely, and we don't grow, uh, we, we grow safely and conservatively. At some point, yes, as we get larger, we're going to face some of the similar challenges. But our model is a, a comp we didn't get into this, but our compensation model is, is, is quite different. Um, our incentives are aligned so that the attorneys bringing in the business um, and the attorneys doing the work um, have an incentive to collaborate, um, and there's, uh, there's clear metrics uh, that, that really allow us to scale more. Our costs, as Yaakov talked about, are also a lot lower. So And variable. Oh, and variable. So while we're distributed, um, because we leverage technology, while we do have uh, brick and mortar offices, um, we also have a lot of virtual offices, which allows us to grow without taking nearly as much risk. Um, I don't know if they're the billable yeah, hour. The, the other thing probably. I think that um, embedded in your question you know, is, I guess to summarize your question is, don't you want to be big too, right? <laughs> um, and of course, you know, we're, the people in our firm, they want to make more money, just like any corporation. Um, but I think that uh, you know, our focus, and I sort of hope we can carry this philosophy as we do grow and as we are, uh, do become more successful, is that we do want to be big, but not past the point that it makes sense for clients and also for the people working in the firm. So if you're going big just because it makes sense for the shareholders at the top, and it doesn't make sense for the clients, doesn't make sense for your employees, doesn't make sense for you know, the environment, doesn't make sense for all, all sorts of other um, constituencies uh, that are being served by your law firm, we want to stop there. So just a follow-up question when you say that whether it makes uh, uh, sense for clients or not. I just wanted to know, in your, in your experience, uh, do you ever happen to talk to GCs where they have complained about some of the big law firms, not only US, but globally, I'm talking about other firm, like the law firms in the UK, who have a very integrated system across the globe. Have they complained that because they have grown big, we are not getting satisfied, or they are not uh, they are not focusing on the quality of the service? Have you ever had a chance to? Now, now call on you got one right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, maybe you can talk a little bit. Sure. Um, I, I have experience having been in private practice and in-house, and clearly from the in-house experience, there really is a considerable amount of frustration with uh, issues including turnaround time, uh, uh, delegating of work to associates. This was a theme that was raised earlier, where partner level attention is warranted. 
and, um, and lack of transparency with respect to uh, what the final bill will be. All of those are not obviously the intent of the large law firm provider, but they are outcomes that have proved frustrating to, to the in-house general counsel who's charged with very tight budget limitations where surprises obviously aren't welcome. So can you say who you are, actually? And, and uh, are they your client? Do you hire these guys? Should I give them the microphone? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 There's a room. There's a room, Mike. Yeah, okay. so uh, my name is Pete Ferriel. I live here in the Boston area. Um, I was a, a partner at a large law firm in town for um, 13 years before going in-house in 2005 to work for a, a global financial services company as a lawyer. And so it's that combination of experience that uh, has led me to observe that there clearly is room for an alternative legal services model that delivers top quality services and yet in a uh, in a way that's more client centric than big law. So do you hire these guys? I certainly would look to hire. All right, them. All right. I think so you're not. Right. You can also look I right here. <laughs> <laughs> right. This, 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 this is this is a sample of. Uh, yeah. you know, some no, no, I know you have clients. <laughs> 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 yeah, Mark Adam. <laughs> Absolutely. We don't have up or out. Um, first of all, as Jakob mentioned, more, most of our associates actually already have lots of experience before they join us. In order to become partner, it's more a question of are they ready? Are they ready to manage something on their own? Um, are they at this, the level of the rest of our partners? It's not just that, okay, eight years, get out or stay. We don't, we don't do that. That's very different. It's more like I think most businesses. So we've got a couple of questions here. One here and then here. Go ahead. Um, so you don't, you obviously don't hire students right out of law school, um, and it seems like you know you go to these big firms where you get like trained. Yes. As an associate. What are the other options maybe in this new development market for right. people coming right out of school, or are you stuck with the ground? Are you just parasitic on law firms? <laughs> it's, it's a big problem, right? Not it's parasitic, <laughs> synergistic. Uh, yeah. 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 No, but but we do we do absolutely we do depend on big law to train them. So. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, but you're highlighting a big, a big problem, right? That all these alternative services models, they can you know, crap on big law all they want, but at the end of the day, the people who have risen to the top, they, they've come through a system that produces, you know, it's, it's kind of a hellish experience for many, but they produce some good lawyers. And so there are a lot of these alternative services companies who are the beneficiary of that system and uh, beneficiaries of that broken system. And so I, I think that if big law is not just going to be some training ground for all these alternative companies, they need to make some shift and you know, look at better ways to re retain the people who get to the top but don't want to have their souls crushed. Right, so I think uh, some alternatives, first of all, let me go back to the slide that talks about these. Uh, most of these do actually require attorneys to have a lot of experience. Uh, but in-house, uh, there are far more options now for less experienced attorneys to go in-house than there used to be. Um, a lot of these no. companies. No. Not, not true. Here, less yeah. experience. It's harder now to go in house with less experience. Is that, oh, okay. Yeah. So sorry. sorry. So Everybody not is parasitic on the law firm. <laughs> <laughs> be very clear <laughs> about this. Okay. Well, I would say that, again, most of these require more experience, but there are more, I would say, I guess, business tracks. They're business for, tracks, right? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, they wouldn't expect people right at a law school to know anything about the law. You graduate law school, I mean, we know this to be true. You graduate knowing how to draft a good brief. There's things that translate into litigation. In the corporate world, there's not a whole lot that you learn that translates there. You kind of have a vocabulary. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these people want people to be conversant, a lot of these companies. So I know Rocket Liar will, will hire people in sales, BD, product development, legal Zoom will as well. They want them to be lawyers. They pay good money. They're good lifestyles. Um, so there, there is sort of another track to get to these places, for sure. Right. And you hires American so. lawyers to manage the... <laughs> And Jeff three hires American lawyers to manage the uh, document. But she asked my question. Oh, Tell okay. us your, how do you compensate one another? How do you, what's your, what's that? With gold. Off? Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, two things. How do you compensate your partners? And uh, what do you expect of people in terms of being business developers versus having expertise? In other words, how do you solve the horrific problem of compensation within? Within big law. Sure. So we have a very open, clear formula, actually. So we have 
uh, the formula, I'll sell you formula and I'll get into detail. 70% of uh, origination, or 70% of what you, uh, the firm bills your clients that you brought in, minus what we call internal rates of other attorneys. What does it mean to bring in a client? Bring in a client simply means that you introduce the client to the firm, whether or not you did any work for the client. You make it very simple. Sometimes it's not fair, but at least it's clear. Uh, internal rates basically is rates within the firm. The attorneys get paid for hourly work when they're the servicing partner. And the uh, attorney that originated the work makes money when they bring in work and gives work to the other attorneys. So what this does is create an incentive for the attorneys and service partners. And I'm saying service partner in that sometimes they're service partners, sometimes they're originators. So if they're a service partner in a certain manner, then they have an incentive to do good work for the originator in that matter so that they would continue to work together. The originator has an incentive to bring in more business and have other attorneys work on that client because they get money for origination. And so this allows for less hierarchy as well because it's very clear. There doesn't need to be you know, management committees that decide what points should be given for participation. There are definitely downsides. Every compensation formula has downsides. Yeah, and we've, so we've opted for clarity rather than, um, yeah, more than anything else. And every, right, every, pro every system has its problems. But what we, what we don't like, though, is the, for those people who have been through the big law firm model, oh, well, yeah, one moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the big law firm model is that, you know, in, in essence, every lawyer is sort of getting paid in the same way, but sometimes there's less opacity about it. So in a big law firm model, you say, well, we're going to give you a salary of this, even though it's just giving you back the money that you brought in. And then, ooh, we're giving you a bonus at the end. Right? So it's psychologically really smart that they withhold something and then give it back. So our model is to say, look, we're going to give it all to you um, at the same time and not have some sort of obscure process where we give you back um, something later on. Yeah, in the back. Well, you mentioned that one of the reasons for the dissatisfaction with you know, the big front model was that a lot of lawyers were no longer satisfied with the last dollar. So you have associates, you said, but they're like five, six, seven, eight year associates. Um, what's different with the lives of that Ramon? I mean, are you not having to bill two, three thousand hours a year, or are you as an eight year associate still working the same number of hours of first or second year associate of big open as you We don't have minimum billable hour targets. We think that that's a really, really poor incentive and sends a really, really bad message to clients. Um, so that's a, that's a big factor. Um, obviously, our salaries, they are, uh, they're lower somewhat. They're still very competitive, but they're lower than um, they are for uh, comparable jobs. So do associates at, just get paid a salary? The, do they have profit sharing? There are, uh, no. So there are associates. We have, we have different models for different, in different circumstances. By and large, they're salary. Okay. Um, but there are certain people that get paid just like partners, mm -hmm. but they're not supervising projects just yet. And that's sort of a self-election type of process. Depends and on their hours are recorded and, and measured? They, no, a lot of times they're not even doing hourly. Yeah. A lot of times it's flat fee. But are they internal? But do you record it? Yeah. No. Do you do it inside? Not no, when not we're doing. We don't re no. require that. So Have you some, ever promoted a part, uh, an associate to partner? Yeah. We are about to. Yes. Um, very soon. Thank you for <laughs> taking the secret. <laughs> <laughs> for the first time. Yes. But no, as of today, we have not. OK. Listen, this is obviously very interesting. There are many other people who have questions, but we always say we end it right at one because people have classes. But I think Michael and Jakob would be happy to chat if anybody didn't get their question answered. But first, let me just thank them for a terrific Thank you so much for having us. I really appreciate the opportunity.